as we think back to last week, we discuss some of the things that we could expect as we go to heaven, those of who have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And if we think back to last week, the Bible does not give a tremendous amount of explicit description or detail of heaven. We understand that there's things as, as the crystal sea. I look forward to seeing that one day. We understand that there's streets of gold. The tree of life will be in heaven. And I look forward to that. As a matter of fact, the river of life will flow directly from the temple in heaven. And I just, I don't know that even in descriptive words, our imaginations can comprehend the vastness and the gloriness or the glory that will actually be in heaven when we enter in. And I believe, and this is just Ray's personal opinion, I believe that the reason why that there is not an extreme amount of detail or description about heaven in God's word is this, because he wants us to be utterly surprised when we get there. He wants us to stand in amazement and stand in awe of what he has created for us. The truth is this, is that we are supposed to stand in awe of who God is. And when I say stand in awe, that means in reverence and in a respectful fear of his power, his authority, and his sovereign nature. If we think back to last week, we can understand from Genesis 1-1 that in the beginning, God was the one who created the heavens and the earth. He created the heavens and the earth with you in mind. You. He created it for you. Not for himself, but for you. God created the earth with the intent that even in the very beginning, one day, we would reside in heaven with our Father. As a matter of fact, Jesus made this point very clear in John 14, verses 3 and 4. In my Father's house are many rooms, or as some translations would say, many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, but I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself that where I am, you may also be. Now, I'm not going to belabor a tremendous amount of uh, commentary on what that verse says. I believe that that verse speaks for itself. Doesn't need a lot of description. We can also think back to last week in Acts chapter 7, verse 49. Our Father also makes the proclamation that heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool. You know, there's many that would choose to believe that the only place that we can actually meet God is in church. I want to give you a spoiler alert right now. That is absolutely unbiblical, and it's absolutely untrue. untrue. We, we tend to forget, though, that earth is his footstool. Moreover, we tend to forget that we, we, you and I, are actually a temple, the temple of the Holy Spirit. In other words, when we come to God's saving grace, we've asked him to save us of our sins. He, we decide and make a decision for him to be the Lord of our life. We ask him to transform our lives or transform our minds and renew us, make us into a new creation from them, something that's old. The Holy Spirit is the one that's living in, in, inside of us and is one, he, the Holy Spirit, is the one that's causing those transformations by us allowing him to do so and for us to take action in order that change be made. We can meet God wherever we are in that moment. God's spirit is with us. I had someone ask me a few weeks ago, Pastor Ray, can I pray out of the spirit? I think you can pray outside of God's will. I, I genuinely do. What God desires for us to do is for us to be aligned with his will for our life. But what I also would suggest to you is this, that if the Holy Spirit does reside in your heart, it's not 
not possible to pray outside of the Spirit. God understands if we're outside of his will, okay? And he has grace available to us for that. But I want to tell you that the Holy Spirit is the one who intercedes in your prayers. The Holy Spirit is the one that gives those prayers to your Heavenly Father. You can't pray outside the Spirit as such if you are, in fact, a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. Now, I want to tell you this. If we believe that the only place you can meet God is here in this building, well, now you've made this building your idol. And God does not look upon that favorably. Yes, we love our church. We love the building that God has given us so that we can gather together in fellowship with one another, spur one another on in love and good deeds, and dive into his word and worship him for who he is. But we don't worship the building. I have to tell you, I've heard in churches in the past say, well, this is mother church so-and-so. No, this is not. This is God's house. This is God's house. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit who has come to God's house to worship Him. Yes, the Lord is here. But don't you ever worship this building. Take care of it. Be a good steward of it. But don't you dare worship this building. And so with those things being said today, as we begin... I want us to talk about hell. It's not something I think that most of us want to discuss favorably. We can understand that it's not a very good place that we would want to be. It's not a good place to spend eternity. And we're going to talk about some of those things today. And I said eternity. So just considering that one word, eternity, there are two places, two, two, not anymore, of eternity. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You said, well, Pastor Ray, what about hell? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I want you to understand something. In the very beginning, there was no hell. It did not exist. There was no need for it. In the beginning, there wasn't. There was no demons. There was no devil. No Satan. And if there was no demons and no Satan, no evil, why was there a need for hell? There absolutely was not. Before Lucifer, being an archangel in the beginning, was cast down from heaven, there was, in fact, no need for hell. I need you to understand that. So, let's look at a couple of things. When did God create hell? Well, as a precursor to what I just said. Jesus spoke of Lucifer being an archangel in the beginning as this in Luke chapter 10. I saw you falling from the sky like lightning from heaven. This is a description that Jesus gives all of those who are listening while he's teaching what happened when Lucifer was cast out of heaven in the midst of his rebellion. When Lucifer fell... When he fell, he became the devil. So, to add to the dilemma of Lucifer falling, he actually conned a third of heaven's angels to join him in his quest for dominion and power. And they were cast out as well. Now, when we could go back to the fall of man in Genesis chapter 3, but I don't want to spend time there this morning. But I do want to allow you to understand and just remember, think back in Genesis chapter 3. We're told that Lucifer, that serpent of old, that snake, Satan, deceived, deceived Eve. And Adam fell into sin. Okay? So... And it's by man's poor choices that we decided to sin. It was our choice because we've been given free will. So let's continue. When was, when was hell created? When sin entered the world by way of the devil's deception and Adam willing to sin, hell was at that point created to be the future prison for Satan, 
for his demons. And now, again, to be clear, the Bible is very specific to call it the abode or the final resting place for the wicked. For the wicked. Again, hell was not created for you. It was not. Revelation 14, 9, B through 10 says this. If anyone worships the beast, the beast being Satan, and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath. Poured in full into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. And that means those who choose to turn their back on the Lord, not accepting him as Lord and Savior, walk away from God's graciousness and his mercy, not allowing him to be the Lord of their life, they will enter into that lake of fire, that place of sulfur and ash, a place of torment. That is, in fact, hell. Sadly, Lucifer was originally created in the Bible, as, as we give a description in Ezekiel chapter 28, as an angel. Again, I mentioned he was an archangel. Verses 11b through verses 15 say this, You were a signet of perfection. He's talking about Satan, Lucifer in the very beginning. So before Lucifer welled up with pride and created rebellion in heaven, he was perfect in all his design. He was perfect in wisdom and he was perfect in beauty. The verse goes on to say, you were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Sardis, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, and crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. I want you to hold on to that description because we're going to get into a little bit of detail there. But it goes on to say, on that day you were created and they were prepared. You were an anointed guardian cherub. He was a guardian cherub. I placed you where you were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of fire you walked. You were blameless in the ways from the day that you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. This is an absolute graphic, literal description of who Lucifer was. Not who he is, but who he was. God gave a glorious covering to the archangel Lucifer before his fall from grace. He gave him a covering of gemstones. Now, this not only speaks of a place of status or prestige, but it speaks of a place of honor that was given to Lucifer in the very beginning. It also suggests this. If we think back to the passage that I just read you with all of the descriptions of all of the stones, it says that he had a covering that was crafted from gold. That means he had a breastplate, an ephod. So what that means is this. What is an ephod, Pastor Ray, you ask? It's what a priest would wear when he would go into the Holy of Holies in God's temple. Lucifer in the beginning was, in fact, a high priest. Not the high priest, but he was a priest. Now, due to this, we can understand he most definitely had a place of position with God. He was created in perfection. Think back. So, what were his priestly duties? Well, he was the worship leader in heaven. He was the worship leader. That was one task that he had. Ezekiel 28 says, The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared before you. What is a timbrel? It's a tambourine. So, and this is just, I'm going to step aside here for just one moment. This is Ray's opinion. 
instruments are in the Bible. I think it's quite all right for us to use guitars, keyboards, pianos, all those sorts of things to create worship for the Lord. Non-instrumental, that's a personal choice that someone makes. But instruments are mentioned in the Bible. They're also mentioned before the Hebrew children crossed the sea to leave Egypt. And so instruments are just fine. Before Satan's fall, he had a significant role, not only as worship leader, but as one who was around God's throne. But we also see in Isaiah 14, 11, again, we see after his fall, this description of your pomp, in other words, your circumstance, who you are, your character, your integrity was brought down to Sheol, was brought to hell. It was brought to hell. Your character brought you low to the bottomless pit of the abyss. And the sound that came from your harps are no more. Though, again, stringed instruments. Lucifer, again, as I said, had a place of privilege. He was one of those angels who surrounded God's throne. He was, in fact, a covering cherub, the Bible says. So he was a covering cherub that covered God's throne. He covered God's throne. I would like to suggest this, and this is just raised terminology. He was a cherub par excellence. He was the best of the best of the best that God had to offer. Now, this was before man. This was before man. So if he was a chair before excellence, uh, par excellence, he was a chief guardian of God's throne as well. And so I can only imagine why pride would have welled up within him. I can only imagine why he said, hey, if I'm this good, I think I'm just going to take God's throne. And it's in that moment that the fall began. The oldest sin in the universe, pride, crept into Satan, Lucifer, the best of the best, just as it does with us. And he chose to rebel. And once iniquity was found, found within him is when rebellion began. Isaiah 14, 12 through 15 says, How far you have fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the dawn. How you are cut down to the ground. You are laid, you, excuse me, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will sit on the throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make for myself, or I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, again, hell, to the far reaches of the pit. The corruption was not placed there by God. Lucifer chose, <coughs> Lucifer chose to be corrupt. And so that would suggest to us by this particular text that Lucifer had free will. Just as you and I have free will. We can make a choice to be cut down low. We can make a choice to fall into the pit or we can make a choice to ascend on the mountain of God most high and be with him forever in eternity. Now, once that corruption was, when, and was within him, he couldn't wait. He could not wait to corrupt God's creation, his most glorious creation in which he calls man. So here I believe there's a twofold issue. Number one, he wanted to be like God. And number two, because he couldn't wait to corrupt man, he was jealous of man. He was jealous of man. And so the timing of his attempted coup for Lucifer was right on cue. So I want you to understand something. If, in fact, hell was not created in the beginning, and hell was, in fact, created 
when Lucifer fell and man stepped into sin, hell was not prepared for you. Hell was not created for you. It was created for the devil and his demons. Nothing more. Matthew 25, 41 says this. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you are cursed. Into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. In this particular passage in Matthew 25, if we were to take time this morning to read the entire text, Jesus is referring to sheep and he's referring to goats. The sheep are those who are in fact believers. Now, we understand that, as I've mentioned before from the pulpit, that sheep sometimes are not always real smart. We tend to get in things we shouldn't get into. Sheep tend to root around in the dirt. They get infections in their nose. They get ear mites. They get infections and all sorts of things. A sheep will even graze the grass and walk right off the edge of a cliff and never realize it. Does that sound familiar? Oh my goodness, that sounds a little bit like us at times. But Jesus also talks about the goats in this passage. Those are the non-believers. Those who choose to follow the good shepherd and those who choose to rebel and seek their own way. Our way, our way never ends well. It always leads to destruction. Let's just think for a moment. Case in point, Judas. Judas sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver and it tormented him. And it says that Judas hung himself and went to his, his own place. Judas chose to rebel against God, to turn away from God, and he chose hell. We choose hell if we don't choose to follow God Almighty, our Creator, and ask Jesus Christ into our hearts. Hell is considered in Scripture a place to be a, it's a place of darkness. Again, some of those words are Sheol, Hades, Hell, the Lake of Fire, the Abyss, and none of those things are good. None of those things. It's a place of darkness. It's a place of separation. It's a place where those who do not choose God as their Creator and Jesus as their Lord and Savior are there to wait judgment. They're there to wait judgment, that great white throne judgment that will be in the end that's mentioned in Revelation chapter 20 when Jesus says this to those unbelievers. Depart from me. I never knew you. Now, Jesus is not going to say that with gladness. He's going to say that with sorrow. And I dare say that he's probably going to be welled up with tears when he has to say, depart from me, I never knew you. Because what he wants to say to you is enter into the kingdom of heaven. Well done, my good and faithful servant. But you've got to walk a narrow road to get there. That narrow road's not always easy. It says few will enter into the narrow gate. The wide gate many will choose. You need to be very careful which road you choose. The narrow road's probably full of potholes, curves, turns, lots of guardrails that might be loose. Stay the course. That wide road is like a superhighway. Oh, you can run fast and do lots of passing and get there, get to your destination early if you so choose. But the destination is not where you generally want to be. There's also a popular belief that Satan, since he is promised to go to hell along with his demons, that he's in charge of hell. Mm -mm. No, no, no. God is in charge of hell. God created hell. And he created hell as a prison. Just remember something. God is sovereign in the universe. That means he carries all authority and power. Again, Lucifer, now known as the devil, can do nothing without God's approval. He can do nothing without God's approval. Will God allow things in our lives that will 
cause us grief at times? Well, absolutely. We live in a fallen, broken world. People will become addicted to drugs and alcohol. Relationships will be broken. Fathers and sons and mothers and daughters and sisters and brothers will have arguments and disagreements and maybe turn on one another. I told someone the other day, two of the greatest ways that I know of to cause an argument in a family, number one is a wedding, number two is a funeral. And I believe that holds true. It holds very true. But what can create a restoration in relationship between one another, between you and I, when we disagree, is remembering that the blood of Jesus Christ was shed so that we can have an ultimate and perfect relationship with him. And if he shed his blood so that our relationship can be restored with him, then dare I say that our relationships between one another can be restored as well. And so we should try everything at all possible to do so. Don't want to get back into that. We talked about forgiveness and making amends a few weeks ago. But nevertheless, God is in charge of hell. It's a prison. And what, let's, just, let's just think. What sense would it make if Satan was in charge of his own prison? Come on. Well, you say, well, Pastor Ray, Joseph was in charge of the prison when he was put in there by Potiphar. It wasn't his prison. It was his place of testimony and a place of his message for time. It wasn't eternal. God is in charge of hell. Again, hell was not created for you. Hell was created for Satan and his demons. Think back to Matthew 25, 41, as we just mentioned. The truth is man is going to be out of place if he goes to hell. Again, hell consists of fire, brimstone, weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a place of horrific, eternal torment. Man wasn't created for torment. It was not created for torment. He was created for an intimate relationship with one another, you and I. He was created for an intimate relationship between he and his heavenly father. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 9 says this. He has not created us, man, to suffer wrath. End of discussion, I trust. End of discussion. Heaven was created for you. As a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, you must understand, heaven was created for you. Think back to John chapter 14, verses 3 and 4. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself. That where I am, you will be also. Heaven has existed since the beginning of eternity. It's our Father's house. It's His house. And Jesus left this world after His resurrection to go and prepare that place. He not only went there to prepare a place in his father's house for you, but he's also preparing for the wedding supper of the Lamb. A celebration. In other words, is this. Jesus is waiting anxiously. He's waiting with expectation. He's waiting earnestly for his children to return home. Heaven. So that we can have a feast and sit at his right hand. But you must choose him. You must make that decision to ask Jesus Christ to come and live within your heart so that the Holy Spirit may reside there and give you guidance and direction, give you wisdom and discernment. Hey, listen. I mentioned in the beginning of this, the Bible does not give explicit, strenuous detail on what heaven looks like. Again, I believe it's because he wants us to be utterly shocked when we get there, to stand in amazement of what he's created for us. However, the Bible 
mentions heaven about 600 times. And he mentions it for a good reason. Because it's not only important to him. Yes, he created it. But he wants it to be important to you. It's your final resting place of eternity. If, in fact, you are a believer. It's your final place of eternity. If, in fact, you are a believer. Now, as I wrap this up, I just... I'm a person who likes to get in the weeds sometimes. And so when I start down a rabbit trail, I find things that just fascinate me. The Bible gives multiple descriptions of heaven in this by Hebrew. And it also gives descriptions by Greek. Now, many of you know, I'm just a country fellow that was raised in Davidson County. And so some of these words I can't pronounce. And though I might try, I'm going to mess them up. But there is one word in the Greek that I think is absolutely phenomenal. Eporaneous. Eporaneous. And that description is for the third heaven. It's the third heaven. This word, Eporaneus, literally translates from the Greek to my father's house. Whew, doesn't get any better than that. It does not get any better. It sends chills down my spine just to consider that. God wants us to be in his house. I don't think there's any other place that would be any better to be than in our father's house. Oh, we can come in here on Sunday morning and we can worship the Lord. And we can hear things about God. We can be taught in Sunday school, just as the children are being taught now. You can hear a decent sermon. But to be in our Father's eternal home. Hey, listen, there's no greater place. He says, in my Father's house are many rooms. Consider something with me, if you will. And this is just Ray's. This is just Ray's interpretation. Again, I'm just a simple fella. My father's house are many rooms that's been prepared for each one of you. So what does that mean? That means your name, if you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, is on the front door of one of those rooms in heaven as we speak. Your name is on the front door of one of those rooms as we speak. And Jesus has gone there to decorate it and prepare it and set it up just for you. Just for you. When will that day be? Only God knows the day that we will enter in individually into the kingdom of heaven if we so choose. But we must choose. It's only God who numbers our days. Only God. Oh, doctors can tell you there's a diagnosis that's not well. Someone else can take your life. And you could die in a car accident. You could die of a heart attack. Whatever the case may be. It's God who has the final say. He is sovereign. But when he has that final say, and you've accepted, and you choose to walk with him and believe, he will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into your kingdom. And I long for that day. I do. Why? Because I long to see my Savior Face to face. I used to think in my youth that I would have all of these questions when I would go to heaven. I'm going to ask Peter so and so, and I'm going to ask Paul, what about this? What was that bright light really like, Paul? Or Jesus? What was it like when they crucified you? 
We're not going to need to ask. We're going to be given perfect knowledge and wisdom. When we enter into the kingdom of heaven, it will all be given to us, and we will know. No questions to be asked. But until then, I've got a question to ask you. Is your heart right with the Lord? You hear me? Is your heart right with the Lord? Do you know today that if you walked out of this building, out of this room, got in your car, and did not make it home, where eternity would be for you? If you don't know, then today's the day that you settle that and you make it known. I don't ever want to hear anybody ever say, I hope I'm going to heaven. Mm Mm-mm, that's not good enough. I want you to know that you know that you know. I want you to know perfectly, intimately, who your Lord and Savior is. It's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. His name is Jesus Christ. So, if you don't know Christ today as your Lord and Savior, then you settle that before you leave. If maybe there's been a, a, a bit of a chasm between you and God, well, if, if you, you're the one that could fix that today. He's standing here waiting on you with open arms. He wants you to come home. Settle it. Make things right. I would love to pray with you and talk with you to make things right with your Heavenly Father. If you're looking for a good church home, hey, you're not, you're not in the perfect spot. This is not a perfect place. But we do love one another. This is a forever family. And we do, in fact, want to love each other as Christ has loved us. And so we would love for you to consider First Christian Church as your forever family in your home. So if you have a need or a burden on your heart this morning, please meet me down front as we stand and as we sing a song of invitation.